everybody all together and all our kids and all our kids' kids and everything like that and meet each other again. So um, I think we're just going to start off. Margie's going to, my sister Margie is going to talk a little bit about Dad's life and we'll let her get started. Hi. Always. Nobody's ever had to um, encourage me to do that one. Yeah, I know. You're here. Okay. First of all, these are all, this information is all from interviews, so if it doesn't sound like me, it's probably not me. I'm just quoting. It's not my fault. Anyways, so this all started when I have been doing interviews. So if you'll notice when I come up to you and I start writing, that's why I'm writing. I want to get it on paper. This is cool. All you kids that have older parents, get them in writing, get them on film. This is your big chance because it's very hard to do it afterwards. Okay? So anyways, my dad, Wally Williams, lived in the middle of the Great Depression. And when my sons and I asked him about this, he claimed that the Great Depression was really no big deal. It didn't really hit his life as hard as others because he said he didn't know any difference. His life was just like everybody else's. Um, it was just a normal childhood. Maybe that's because Wally always thought that the city of Ferndale, Michigan was the greatest place on the planet to be a kid. If he was fast enough and his mother didn't catch him, he'd down his mug of coffee every morning, grab a piece of toast, throw on his overalls, no shirt, no shoes, and run out. And he wouldn't be back until dinner time. There were fields to explore in Ferndale. There were ponds to catch pollywog and frogs in, and places to pick blueberries, wild strawberries, and gather hazelnuts. There was always a pickup baseball or a basketball game, either in the field by their house or at the Ferndale Methodist Episcopal Church. And there were relatives all around relatives to go to church with, to eat with, to play cards with, to play games with, and to visit with after church. Now that's the, the world that Wally Herbert Williams was born into on August 6, 1924 in Detroit, Michigan. Even his name, this is Larry, this is for you, even his name honors his relatives. His first name, Wally, was his dad, Floyd Sr.'s mother, Ada Mae Wally's maiden name. That's where that came from. And his middle name, Herbert, was after Lillian's sister, Jessie, because he was born in that house where of Herb and Jessie Fennell. Is that how you pronounce yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I only see these things in writing, so you guys are going to have to help me. And when nine-year-old cousin Grace was told she had a new cousin, she was surprised because she didn't think that her Aunt Lillian could do such a thing. <laughs> At the time of Wally's birth, his father, Floyd Sr., co-owned Williams Brothers Construction Company, which is ba was based in Ferndale, Michigan, with Floyd's brother, who is are great and I'm the first generation cousin so I don't know how you're gonna figure this one out but anyways for him he was my great Uncle Wally. Dad's mother Lillian Malader Williams did the paperwork for the business while she cared for her family. The houses they built were either rented or sold for about four thousand five hundred $4,500 a piece, and Wally's earliest memory was of being on the porch with his older brother Floyd Jr., that's Uncle Floyd to me, um, watching his cousin Gilbert and his team digging out the foundation in the basement 
for Margaret Taft's house, which is who lived across who lived across the street from them. In a few years, the brother's dad joined a job shop because there simply weren't enough jobs around, but kept building houses on the side. But all too soon, after the Williams brothers construction, built parts of the Ferndale Methodist Church, as well as over 70 houses in Ferndale alone and in other places around that area. Um, the business went under and Floyd Sr. began working full-time for General Motors. That's your body. The years moved on. Wally's early friends were his pet mice <laughs> and his rats. A white rat. And, but in, um, but in Washington Elementary School, Wally joined what he called a gang. I don't know if I'd call this a gang. But anyways, and their motto was they were definitely against girls. <laughs> Wally was good in school and moved from Taft Junior High to Lincoln High School. And through it all, he had his best friend, his older brother. They're about three and a half years old difference, and that was Floyd Jr. Long hours were spent in the home their father and uncle built in the upstairs bedroom, and if you've ever been up there, it is the coolest place. Um, they were almost always together, so much so that when the kids gave Floyd Jr. the name of Willie, which is short for Williams, it was only logical that Wally soon became known as Wee Willie. I didn't. The, the brothers shared chores like going to pick up ice for the ice box, also known as the refrigerator back then, they, which was a great job to do in the summer, but not so much in the winter. Um, they also had a paper route which they shared. And they got about four and a half cents for each paper that they sold. They had one bicycle between the two of them. They shared everything in short. Mom just said that they had one bicycle between the two of them. They were brothers. And they also sat around the radio listening to radio programs and sporting events. For example, Wally even admitted that he and Floyd Jr. once refused to go to school because the Detroit Tigers baseball team were in the World Series and they didn't want to miss a game. So when the folks insisted that the boys go to school, they greatly impressed all their friends by teaching Lillian, my grandmother, how to keep box scores. I think that is so cool. I tried to learn it. It is hard. Around this time, another brother, John Austin, was born, wherever he is. And then, and five years later, came the family's only girl, who is my Aunt Joyce. Wally excelled in math and did well in sports. Actually, both Walt, Floyd Jr. and Wally were on the track team and the basketball teams. And by the way, Wally always warmed the bench when Floyd was around. But when Floyd graduated, Wally finally became the captain of the track team during his senior year. Okay, by this time, Wally graduated from high school. He joined the, a drafting shop, ran after school with his former teammates on the track team, and waited until he was old enough to enlist. All his friends were already gone. They were already overseas. And things, because things had changed in the world. The United States entered the war. Wally enlisted at the police station soon after his 18th birthday. And basic training, and I know this is, this is the weird part for me. Basic training, he said, wasn't a big deal. It was more like an adventure because he was in great shape. The Army tests were easy, mainly because he felt he was very lucky that they <laughs> asked him the right questions which means there was not one single English 
grammar question on the test. He was great in math. Um, so Wally was then sent to engineering classes while he was in, in the Army. But the Army, when the Army decided they needed more men to fight, they sent him to the European theater to make the final push into Germany. Dad and his buddies received numerous awards, including two Purple Hearts and a Bronze Star. A bronze Star. And he, by the way, always called those his fruit salad. Um, for a service during, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce this, where are you? Hertz, Hertzken. Hertzken, <laughs> Germany, and the Battle of the Bulge. And by the way, my dad couldn't pronounce these kinds of words either. <laughs> I can. Um, he was told, um, Ted's got a story that he knew no other, he knew. Well, he used to tell us he knew every language except for Greek. And you'd mention a language and he'd say, that's Greek to me. <laughs> so, short, I've inherited something from him. Um, when Wally returned from the Army, he ordered a car that took over a year to complete because of all the back orders. When the car arrived, he paid $1,500 for it. But since he didn't have a, a license, Grandpa, his dad, drove it across Woodward Avenue, and then Wally got in and drove it the rest of the way home. So in short, that driving at 14, that's been a long, there's a legacy in there someplace. Um, and then uh, he figured he was competent, competent enough to drive um, in about two weeks, and then he went and he took his test and he passed. Through the GI Bill, Wally attended college and worked at also at the college maintenance crew. He had both lettered in both track and basketball, and he received his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Lawrence Tech, which is now Lawrence University, right? Yeah. Okay. But it was also around this time that things got kind of interesting. Wally's friends Notice he was kind of on the shy side. And they started fixing him up on dates. They were always one-off dates. You know, he never called anybody. Until um, Gordon Rowe fixed him up with a young girl. He thought of her as a lady. She had really nice manners. And she was a nursing student. And even though Ann Schubert, who is my mother, was 18 years old, and Dad said she looked about 16, he thought she was real pretty, and he knew right away from date one that he was going to marry her. But she took a little bit of convincing. It took her about a year. In fact, through part of that time, she continued to date other fellas. Um, one of their first dates, though, was when Wally invited Ann to a family picnic, which turned out to be the Malater annual family reunion with his parents. That was okay. His siblings, brothers and sisters. That's not bad. And, oh yeah, 72 aunts, uncles, and cousins. <laughs> they all thought Anne was adorable and out with him. Now, one of their favorite places to date, by the way, Mom, I should warn you, I've rewritten this. <laughs> one of their favorite places to date was in Wally's car on Belle Isle. <laughs> Both Anne and Wally admitted, and this is a quote, a lot of things happened in that Chevrolet, <laughs> including teaching oh, Anne to drive because there wasn't anything else to do. <laughs> Wally even proposed to Anne in that car on her birthday. Mm -hmm. When Wally asked Mom's parents for her hand in marriage, my grandmother Schubert, Anne's, Anne's mom, gave Wally, a nickel, a nickel she still has for taking mom off 
their hands. <laughs> so, told me that when I was real little. <laughs> So, on April 1st, 1949, and yes, that is April Fool's Day, Wally Williams and Ann Shepard were married in the Methodist Episcopal Church in Ferndale, which, by the way, is the same church that Brother John and his wife June were married in. And most of us cousins were baptized there. Because Ann's nursing program had a residential requirement, Married women were not allowed in the program, so Wally continued to live with his parents John and John and Joyce in Ferndale while Anne continued to be living at the Deaconess Hospital on site. Wally would also often sneak up the back stairs to visit Anne at work, and they continued to work on Anne's driving skills, and I'm not really sure why Dad blushed when he told me that one. Um, however, 10 days after all, after they were married, about 10 days, Wally took Anne to the police department so that she could pick up the book so that they could study up on the law so that they, she could pass her test. Anne goes into the station and she comes out with a policeman. He tells, the policeman tells Wally to get out of the car, gets in the passenger seat, and Anne gets in the other side. So this pair drove around for the while, a while. Ann parks, goes into the station, and comes out with her driver's license. Now that was pretty cool. Ann drove all the way to Wally's parents' house, um, to their home in Ferndale. And the couple stayed there a while and visited. And then Ann decided she'd get in the driver's seat and back out of the car straight into the chimney. There is a There's chip still, a still there. Chip. We still checked it. it out. And now Anne looked at the place she, that she broke off and she began to stop because she knew that um, Grandma and Grandpa were going to yell at her. I mean, shoot, she left an everlasting mark in, in the house. She waited to be yelled at. And to her surprise, she looked up to see Wally, his parents, and Sister Joyce all on the porch laughing their heads off. I was amazed. My parents didn't do that. Apparent, apparently, the couples practicing Anne's driving skills paid off in other ways, too. Because right around July and Anne wants me to make sure that you guys know this was a long time. Um, Anne discovers she's pregnant and she gets kicked out of the nursing school. The couple move in together and after their first big road trip to Yellowstone Park, a few months later, well actually about eight, nine months later, um, Sister Kathy is born. Um, followed 18 months later by my older brother Mike then three and a half years later by me, and followed by up three years later by my little brother Ted, who's not so little. And dad, my dad also joins General Motors and he works as a dye designer. Okay, this follows the usual family years, like all of you. We kids grew up. We attended school, we played with each other, we fought with each other. We learned how to love each other and we became a family. We regularly visited oops, We regularly visited Belle Isle, Greenfield Village, the Detroit Zoo, parks and the like, and on Sundays and holidays after church we spent with either one set of grandparents or the others while we got to know and love our Williams cousins, many of who are here today. Mom and Dad built houses in Inkster, in Royal Oak, and in Troy, Michigan. And with each move, Mom had kind of hoped that there would be plenty of room. But like most families, each time the family congregated where? In the kitchen, under my mom's feet. Numerous cast parties, birthday parties, sleepovers over the hill parties, and wedding receptions 
and Grandma and Grandpa's 50th wedding anniversary were intended were attended by friends and relatives from all over the country. We all soon discovered that Thanksgiving wasn't Thanksgiving unless, unless at least 20 aunts, uncles, cousins, and friends came. The days went on and soon Ann and Wally were grandparents. Mom and Dad, Mom graduated from college, got a job, and they began to indulge their love of travel. They traveled throughout Europe, and Dad began taking side trips touring battlefields he had been into during the war. There were many more trips to Hawaii, Alaska, um, the Amazon, Tahiti, Capo Canyon, and, and in Mexico. They go to Disneyland, Cal Florida, California, <coughs> Florida, and many other places some with grandkids, some with <coughs> us kids, but mostly on their own. But the best trips are when they can retire and travel. They build a home in Green Valley, Arizona in 1988, and they return to Michi Michigan every once in a while and meet and visit with grandchildren, great-grandchildren, aunts, uncles, cousins, you name it, and to the state of Washington, to meet their very last grandchild, who is Aria, and she is five now. I know, I know right now that I'm kind of right, light on religion, but when I asked my dad about this, did he pray, he said, absolutely not. But then when I asked him, so do you believe in God? He said, why, of course, I talk to him every day. So, but mainly, dad was a man who lived out his faith. Dad volunteered at Casa Maria Soup Kitchen in Tucson and the White Elephant, which was a resale shop, which is a resale shop also in, in Green Valley, which Ted is going to tell you about a little bit. And so yes, God knew that Wally Herbert Williams was a good and faithful servant. And Dad continued to serve. With Dad's stroke came a change of character. Some people became grouchy when they get a stroke, but Dad became more demonstrative. He patted Mom's hand and told her how pretty she was and how much he loved her. A view that he had told me and my sons and my friends many times over, but he was always too shy to tell Anne. He loved to make Mom giggle. He loved to make her blush, which is, by the way, the best fun. I can now understand why he <laughs> likes that. And he was always pleased to see her, even when he didn't tell her. And Dad spent his final years at La Hacienda in a nursing home, in a valiant struggle to learn how to swallow again and being cared for by many loving hands. We were all overjoyed when he was able to eat in the dining room, even if it was only what he called mush. And even in his final days, my dad made people feel loved because he was grateful for their help. And by the way, he was grateful for their visits. He told me many times how his brother and his sister and his sister-in-law came to visit. He remembered that, which is pretty amazing. Now, my mom wants me to remind you that her husband, Wally, was a very giving man who did what he did just because it needed to be done. He would help you, and if you needed help, he'd just come. He stuck up for people regardless of the circumstances. For example, when the neighborhood kids continually knocked over the mailbox from the man across the street where we lived in, in Lake Charnwood. He went and he finally stuck both mailboxes on one post. Nobody knocked down the mailbox ever again. He also stopped a little girl from choking. My dad did CPR on her until the ambulance came. And his mom said he even gave his brain away for the study of dementia. When we asked him about how he felt about this, and also what he thought about being cremated, you know, because 
I admit that's a, been a journey for me. He said he didn't care. He wouldn't be needing anything anymore anyways. And what is dad's legacy? And for that matter, <coughs> what is the legacy that all our relatives have, that have gone before, what are they trying to teach <coughs> us? Every story has a good, good lesson. Um, all of the people here, we have been brought up to be kind and loving and polite and caring to each other and to our neighbors, to our friends. <coughs> we are known for that. Right? Right. We have many different last names, but we are all people you can count on in, the, in a pitch. And also, oh, there's our dry sense of humor, at which I can assure you is alive and well and living in all of us. We can't describe it, but we know it when we hear it. And we are thankful to the generations that have lived be and gone before us. And finally, we're like the reason why we are here today, you know, I was listening on the way over here to the circle of life. This is it. We are the circle of life we've got. We have left some people in the cemetery. They are here with us. We have children from way little all the way up. Some of us are older and grayer, not me, I never gray, but we'll discuss that later. But we are all legacies to everyone who has gone before us. And as Dad would say, what more can you want? Thank you. Um, my granddaughter, Sarah, she, she has um, some memories that she wrote in her little book. This is a story I made during school. It's called The Far and Gone. I only saw you twice. We went to Arizona to visit you, and you came here to Michigan, and we went to a Tigers game together. But when you went back, I didn't realize it would be the last time I ever saw you again. It had been three years since I saw you, and one year ago you got sick. I never saw you after I was eight. The last two things I can remember of you was your nice warm smile and your kind heart. I will never forget you. I knew I know you're always watching over me all the time, and I just hope you know how much I miss you and I wish I could have seen you before you died. Even though you're dead, I know you are still helping me through life. I will never forget the last time we spent together. I will never forget your great grandpa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one time I was with him when he was in, at La Hacienda and they were having a memory class and there were many people seated around quite a large table and they were just talking about history and trying to help the people to remember things and someone, the leader of the group, one of the nurses there, she said, does anybody remember who crossed the Alps with his elephants long time ago, you know, and back in BC and nobody answered anything and then dad said Hannibal you know and she turned the nurse turned to him and she said Wally how did you know that and he said very straight face I was there <laughs> and she said are you sure this was a long 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 time ago and he said I was very young <laughs> then he got so this devilish everybody smile. Everybody at the table started laughing so hard, and it, it was just a, an example of his sense of humor. He, he was just very um, sarcastic at times, but he was such a good guy. So, um, does anybody else have anything that they'd like to share? Five. Ted's daughter. Um, one time when he was at the hospital, Lots of times when I came there, um, he always say you look good. Oh, that's <laughs> so, um, so special. our brother Ted has a letter that he wrote to Dad when Dad first entered the hospital, and it's about Dad being his hero, and he's going to read that to you.
When I was young, I always thought my dad was, was the greatest dad, but I never told him that. And as I got older, I reflected on that. I remember one time that he was visiting, he and mom were visiting uh, in Bellingham, where I live north of Seattle. And they had spent a few days visiting, and they were just about to leave. And um, I ran up to their car, and I knocked on the window, and Dad rolled down the window, and I said, Dad, I love you. And he said, I love you too. And they drove away. It was just really clear, you know, as my parents were getting older, and I was getting older, that the more precious that time was together. And then, um, Two years ago, when he had a stroke, um, I went to visit. He had just um, come from the, just not too long before that, come from the hospital to La Hacienda, where he spent his last two years. And I was visiting, and Margie was also visiting at that time. and. The night I got there, I got really inspired, and I hand wrote a letter to him. And I decided, I'm going to read this to you, Dad. So the next day I came in there, and Margie and I were sitting with my dad. And that's what I'm, I'm going to read to you, um, some of that letter. And just imagine, you know, he's sitting there, and I'm reading this to him. <clears throat> Dear Dad, you are my hero. You've been a terrific dad, and I'm very proud to be your son. You've been a huge, huge influence on my life and who I am today. You inspired me to learn to use my mind well for the benefit of other people. You've been an example as I went through school and did well, and I became a teacher and a college dean, and I continue to commit myself to the well-being of others through helping people get an education who wouldn't otherwise. And because of that, your legacy lives on. You're continuing to help many people. Thank you for putting up a chalkboard in the back hallway when I was a little kid on our Lake Charnwood house so that Kathy could teach me math. And 20 years later, I could teach her physics so she could get through college. <laughs> so what comes around goes around. Thank you for the, all the wonderful outdoor experiences you've given me. I still remember when I was four years old and you took me on the first canoe trip. And I'm not sure, we used to go to uh, on weekend canoe trips. I'm not sure if it was the Rifle River or the Pine River. Um, Mike can probably help me reconstruct that. Peterson Bridge. I remember we were coming up to the end of the trip. Mike, you were in the front, and Dad, you were sitting in the back steering, and I was sitting in the middle. And I was just loving it and hoping the trip would never end. I loved it so much. Thank you for all those canoe trips through all those years. I remember we lived by Lake Chartonwood, which is, I don't know, what is that, five, seven miles ago? By the way, being here and seeing all these landmarks, I've got, you know, a five, ten-year-old memory, and everything is <coughs> kind of strange, because it looks kind of through the lens of being a little kid. So living by the lake, you required, you and Mom required, that we demonstrate that we could swim across the lake and back on our own to show that we knew how to swim and we didn't have to have you there all along to, to take care of us. So I remember you being in the canoe next to me as I swam across the lake and swam back again. So then two years ago when, when I told that to my dad, he said, well, it's a really good thing that you didn't have any problem because I'm really not a very good swimmer, and I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> so that's the way my dad was. He was humble. 
he didn't he didn't act like he was better than anybody. And like Margie was saying, that's something he's passed on to all of us. So I'm going to tell you also some of the um, some of the other things. Margie mentioned that that when um, mom and dad moved to Arizona, dad continued to give. And even before that, some things I really respected about my dad was he gave blood all the time. And um, it was just very generous. When he retired, he continued to volunteer at Casa Maria. When we had the memorial in um, Green Valley, the director of Casa Maria Soup Kitchen came and talked. And the way um, my mom and dad got connected with Casa Maria is that I lived in Arizona and I volunteered at the soup kitchen uh, back in the um, early 80s. And I got to know Brian. And Brian came and he really honored my dad and my mom and my brother and me and the whole family for coming and helping the homeless people. So that was a wonderful, generous gift that my dad gave. And also he volunteered at the White Elephant where uh, they sell uh, used things. And that money goes to helping people with scholarships, students to go through school, um, needy people. So two, he continued to give. Two million last year. So they're very successful. And oh, they've yeah. helped a lot of people. And my dad gave to that. Another thing, um, actually I'll tell this the way I told him, Dad, I, I really respect your military service and how all the way to the end you were very connected to all your comrades who you served with. And um, he would talk about them and he would call them. Um, and I really respect that camaraderie and that generous spirit when he was at uh, La Hacienda and even to the end he would thank people for everything that all the food and the kindness he was always kind to people you know even when he was the one who was in need and uh, after he passed away um, and we visited um, just a month ago um, I remember talking to the speech therapist, who we worked a lot with, who helped him get his ability to swallow and eat again back. And she said she would come to work and first come and visit my dad because he would say, like Aria said, you're looking good. And, mm -hmm. and those people were fed by him. And that's the way he was. So I want to tell you also, the last time I spoke to my dad, um, he was going downhill and he wasn't able to eat. And as we know, he loved to eat. And one day he was um, able to eat a little bit. And mom called me on the phone and said, you know, this is really good news. Dad's feeling a little better, able to eat a few things. Here, talk to your dad. And I talked to him for just a minute and said, I'm really happy you're able to eat some. And I said, Dad, I love you. <clears throat> and he said to me, I love you, Ted. And those were the last words he said to me. And I'll cherish those forever, those words. <clears throat> so as Margie said also, you know, my dad's legacy lives on in all of us. So it just made it more poignant for me. You know, cherish each other, be kind to each other, because um, family is very valuable. And I thank you all for being here and celebrating the life of my dad, Wally Williams. <laughs>